Hi, I'm Joshua, and I'm an INTP, and first and foremost, I would like to say thank you for viewing this video. Uh, the topic of this video will be on the appreciation of nuance, or of the aesthetics of nuance, and it is to say that one pattern I'm noticing as I move up in uh, my mathematical and uh, scientific education is that when you're looking at the top performers or the uh, best teachers there are not great uh, factors that distinguish uh, one from the other so if you're looking at someone who is a C performer and a B performer or an A performer and a differentials equation uh, class, there is not a great deal of difference in their mathematical knowledge. Um, and what is, there is differences in is the way in which they assort, arrange their knowledge, use it, and the small, uh, peculiar or s small and particular nuances or details that they uh, apply to whatever problem they're solving or uh, whatever manipulation and uh, massaging of an equation that they're doing. Uh, even with a teacher, I'm noticing that it is not necessarily the volume of words but the quality of words and the quality of expan explanation contained in the words themselves. Uh, I noticed that the best teachers don't have to say as much and can get their point across or ask the necessary questions or the right questions, and it's so subjective in saying what the right questions are, it's just a general pattern I notice is that they're able to do a lot more with a little than the others of their same class. And I think, and I see, and I, I see it in uh, pro sports. So, uh, for example, tennis, if you're on the world stage, you are better than 98% of the world. Yet, if you're on the world stage and you're better than 98% of the world, you may not be in the top 2% of the world stage. Uh, you may not be uh, Roger Federer or you may not be uh, Serena Williams. You just may not, you most likely are not in that top 2 percentile. And it's always something that amazes me that though you have the NBA or the NFL and though you have PhDs in physics and though you have uh, PhDs with mathematics, there are those who wind up in the Hall of Fame, there are those who win Fields medals, and there are those who win Nobel Prizes, and there are those who are just members of the National Academy and so forth. And it's to say that the differences that are stark are not giant and obvious. At least I don't think. Because um, it's very rare that you meet a profoundly gifted uh, intellectual individual. So someone who is uh, so profoundly intelligent that they are truly a phenom and they're something that's rarely seen. Uh, even those individuals typically have a great deal of training and um, history with their subject uh, and it's to say that uh, not to um, just not to uh, discredit or to uh, downplay their intellectual giftedness, but the uh, factor of intellectual giftedness oftentimes is not the thing that catapults them to the top of their field and their domain, 
but rather a deliberate practice. And um, it's also to say that they're rare in of themselves. And I don't think that every person who's won a Nobel Prize, though they have taken an average IQ of most Nobel laureates, and surprisingly, it's an IQ of an average of 120 in physics, 120 uh, in chemistry and physics, it's 120. I don't know about the other uh, ones. It's anywhere from 120 to 140. Um, so it's ranging around roughly 130. But 130, 120, 140, you can still win a Nobel Prize. 120 is just a little above average intelligence, but uh, not that great. And I suppose the point I'm trying to make in this statement is that uh, what explains for the differences in people a lot of times and their performances aren't very obvious, superficial things. They're not things that you can just walk up to the person and look at them per se and know that they just completely outclass everyone else in their field or their domain. It's to say even about phones that you can look at a phone and its appearance mimics all others of its variety and of its class, but the quality of its performance isn't necessarily mimicked across its across the qual across the class of phones it comes in, and I just mean particularly smartphones. Um, most people like uh, iPhones, and I think most people agree that iPhones are more user friendly and just have a better OS than uh, the other uh, phones. And Androids are close competitors, and uh, Samsung is a close competitor, but they still don't beat out the iPhone. And it's to say that is there great is there a great deal of difference between the phones? No, not necessarily and their overall makeup and their overall presentation. Sort of the key factors that would get someone in the game uh, of being the best or being the top is all accounted and addressed for. So you won't usually get into the NBA if you don't have a solid scoring game, the requisite height, athletic ability and uh, defensive ability and basketball understanding though in this day and age in the NBA so there's a lack of defense so maybe just offensive um, ability and the same in tennis if you can't typically it's very rare on the men's circuit to the men's world circuit to find someone who can't serve the ball at at least 90 miles per hour and that's the minimum so you're not usually up there if you're not really profoundly good at what you do in comparison to the relative population. So then when you look at that subclass of population, there are yet and still people who are on the top of that one and are their abilities and even the amount of practice, I speculate to some extent, is closer in uh, its uh, barometer and range than uh, the amount of practice uh, amongst the lower tiers. So the amount of time that somebody on the pro tennis circuit practices versus the amount of time that somebody on the junior circuit practices is something that golfs the other people. The, golfs, the pro circuit golfs the junior circuit. But... Um, I don't think everybody in the pro circuit just their training golfs each other. Um, it's a very uh, widely circulated cliche in sports that you just outwork everyone else and you just won't outwork me. But everybody's usually when they're up there is working very, very hard. And um, most people, I mean, like, there's obviously. There's cases and situations. Um, but just if you want to be good, and if you're there, you are good, you are giving a great deal of 
attention, focus, and effort in doing a substantial amount of practice. And when you uh, select out for things such as uh, chance events like injuries and um, addictions and un unforeseen things that really retards one ability to be in the top 2% of the higher their higher domains of and fields it's um not really clear why some people are just much better than other people and um then i started to think because i made a video on the rarity of good sorry i was scratching my back but I, I made a video on the rarity of good a while back and i've still been pondering this question but then i started to make some observations just in my own local environment and um it's just that I noticed that if you walk into, let's say, a uh, linear algebra class or just any um, higher tier uh, undergraduate mathematics course, most students in those classes are good at mathematics. They're what any lay person would consider good at mathematics, but there are still people who are substantially better than the other people in their classes and they're not and I've noticed as uh, just in terms of my own observations some of them are not profoundly gifted they're just they're not significantly more intelligent than their classmates I um, notice as you go up in um, college that the IQ divide starts to even out until you get to uh, graduate school and then there's just a serious difference there for different reasons because you have some individuals that get into graduate school uh, merely by their grades and what predicts good grades typically is the trait of conscientiousness so they're very organized detailed people and are hard workers and really good at meeting deadlines and uh, doing projects and things. So that gets them into graduate school. And then you have other people who are high on openness and uh, just have very high uh, intellectual uh, capacity or just an intellectual overexcitability. And they're really drawn to one subject and they study it uh, diligently and are pretty monolithic and uh, pretty intellectually profound. And they get there as well. So those, that's like the two people that you get in really conscientious person in comparison to intellectual stud is um, there tends to be a gulf there, but they keep up with each other in different ways because the conscientious person works very hard. It's not to say the intellectually studly person doesn't work very hard. It's just they take different strategies and um, they in nature keeps them at balance typically um, at least in graduate school because it sucks for everyone when you get there at least from what I'm hearing what I'm finding out from friends um, whether you're profoundly uh, gifted or just really conscientious graduate school is a horrible experience for almost everyone um, so uh, j just to say that it's very rare that you find any well-established field or any well-established domain that has an expert tier or a pro tier and um, the general ability of everyone in that expert or that pro tier and I say well-established meaning it's existed for at least 40 to 50 years um, it's, it's typically it's just not completely dominated and one-sided and the uh, general and general abilities of the individuals people are essentially the same um, there are differences and they're important but they get uh, flattened out um, essentially now why are some why do just some people do better so much much more better than others and I think work ethic is a part of it and I think motivation is a part of it but it was it's just observations in my own uh, personal sphere that has allowed me to realize it's that mastery and uh, 
its presentation is a presentation of nuance. Those who uh, really understand and know things don't have to do as much as other people, per se, in uh, thought and in uh, action. They have a collection of uh, patterns of behavior that they have worked on and uh, sculpted or uh, mental representations that are so fine, so fine and so detailed that they pull out small nuances and inflections here and there that have these very large cascading and rippling effects on their overall performance and presentation. And um, I'm not gonna say skill or mastery is a self-organizing system, uh, though it seems that uh, small details uh, win the day in that race also, but it seems that small details in so far as nuances really say something to the quality of a work or the quality of someone's ability rather than the overt, grossly obvious things. Uh, they talk about Roger Federer's uh, forehand and his backhand and the way he holds his racket and the way he turns the thing and the spin he can put on the ball just by his mere, his pure grace, finesse, and how much power he generates with that. It's uh, That is an, a result of Roger Federer's skill um, and his abilities coming together to be something uh, wonderful to watch when he was in his prime and even in his later years for him to have the longevity that he did to be so dominant in tennis he is my most favorite tennis player and um, Roger Federer is a good example just that the nuances make the game per se for him and I noticed that the ones that in that most people would consider great or the top of their field, it is in the small choices and details in their game or in their pattern of understanding that greatly shift the landscape for them to stand over others in their fields and their domains. So I think the reason for the disparity of good is that what makes things good aren't necessarily obvious and it is a collection it seems to me at this point of small details that make something profoundly good I write and I notice that in my writing it is more or less word choice and the structure of prose or the structure of my sentences that make something good or not and uh, I think anybody says well duh but it's not as well duh as that and so far as that anyone can have a very uh, robust vocabulary I think so long as they just listen to people who are fairly uh, intelligent uh, talk and listen and read a lot I, I get a majority of my vocabulary from reading I think anybody who reads uh, enough and anybody who um, listens to lectures and debates is going to have a very well-versed vocabulary, but having a robust vocabulary doesn't mean a damn thing when you're writing. It, it's helpful, but um, it's not. You can read people like Hemingway, and you can read people like Orwell, and you can read... Uh, People like H.G. Uh, Wells and D.H. Uh, Lawrence, and um, they don't use extremely sophisticated language. Um, they're not a writer like Virginia Woolf, uh, but they have a quality to their work that is profound, and you, <laughs> I will read a D.H. Lawrence book more than once, and it's by way of his rendering of the story, 
And it's by way of his rendering of the story in terms of his word choice, where he at, the words he actually selects, how he fits the words together, and the overall pattern and schema of the entire paragraph and the uh, plot of the story that is just this um, small incremental picture that makes up this very uh, nuanced whole. I, it's like um, Joseph Campbell's book, A Hero with a Thousand Faces, or those um, murals where it's one picture made up of a thousand smaller pictures that aren't necessary, that are uh, related to the larger picture, but stand as pictures of their own. And the closer you look into it, the more you see in terms of the picture, you can zoom in and see a great deal, or you could zoom out and see a great deal, and it would all be profound. And that's what I find in good things, in people who sit at the top, and possibly a reason for the rarity of good, because I don't really know how one gets there. I know in writing, it's by, I know this in writing, it's by way of doing it, and editing it, and uh, reading as much as you can and writing as much as you can but who's to say what necessarily gets you to that place where you can write um, something like a D.H. Lawrence book or you could write The Death of a Moth I know I said Virginia Woolf was a type of writer but in her essay A Death of a, of a Moth she didn't, she didn't I mean like She's talking about being in her living room, watching a moth flutter about the window pane in a, uh, it's, it's a autumn day, and she watches the thing die, and you read her, about, you read about her watching a moth die, and having this, um, visceral and, um, vicarious uh, experience through the moth and that is one of the that's one of my favorite essays the death of a moth uh, neurotically enough and um, but Virginia Woolf does I don't know a lot of people who could do that or write that and she doesn't do she does a lot with not very much and um, it's that, and it's that, and I wish I could uh, delineate and articulate what that is other than nuance. And it just seems to be infinite layers of nuance stacked, up, stacked on top of each other like a fine structure that makes good things and that makes profound performances or individuals with profound skill or ability. And it's what essentially makes something good. There are not stark contrast differences in people in the higher echelons of domains. But there are these subtle variations that when they are compounded in a person, puts them head and shoulders above their peers. Um, I don't think that life, it seems, is a game of inches to steal an Al Pacino quote uh, every given Sunday. <laughs> but it seems that life truly is a game of inches. And what makes something good is really a game of inches. It's a game of nuance. And the devil is really in the details. And uh, lo and behold, an INTP, me, <laughs> would say something like that. But it's just that I think that that's why most things aren't good. And I think that that's why you have people who are better than all of the best of their peers. And I don't think it comes down to something uh, as simply as IQ or um, genetic inheritance. I think that it's a part of the picture. But I know that uh, I always use the example of Edward Witten. 
Um, and I'm not hating on Edward Witten as a physicist, but I know Edward Witten is profoundly intelligent in terms of his IQ. Uh, the man is um, extremely gifted, and it was uh, very obvious. Um, I think the same thing with um, Terence Tao, the mathematician. Well, it's, it's I think his IQ is out there, but uh, Terence Tao... Uh, Cedric Villani is, is the individual who won the uh, Fields Medal, and uh, Steve uh, Waj, I'm not going to try and murder his name, but the uh, lover of symmetry and uh, particle physics and the standard model is the one who won the uh, Nobel Prize. And I think that generally, if you looked at the IQs of uh, Tao and Villani, or looked at Witten and Steve, who has a very hard Scandinavian name, I think, to pronounce, I don't think that their IQs differ all that much. I think that they would be uh, pretty close, but the individuals who... Um, do exemplary things, there's something else there. And it seems that that something else, the more that I peel it back, are like the layers of an onion and are a lot like onion skins. There are these fine, uh, thick layers of nuance that uh, give it this general appearance as something different. But as you peel the thing back, there's nothing really different there. And I say there's nothing really different there because in there's no center inside of an onion. It's just layers. But there's nothing really different there in terms of that they have typically the same general abilities as their peers, the same uh, educational background and training. And there is, I know, a craftsmanship and a push towards mastery in the others that may not be there in the others, but I don't think that that's not there in the others. And that's what's so confusing to me about it, because I know Terrence Tao works profoundly hard at mathematics, and he wouldn't be where he was if he didn't. But um, what the heck the differentiating factor is beyond um, deliberate practice you got me, but it can be uh, summed and explained in the small um, compounding effect of nuances in the individual's understanding, skill, presentation, or why one, I think, why some uh, items of media and uh, technology and um, commerce and consumption are better than others is just by way of small, uh, a combination of very small things that make them what they are. But what's good about something and what's good about someone possibly are uh, nuanced details that aren't uh, readily apparent on the surface, but say everything in the uh, end and um, have everything to say about what the end picture looks like. And it's to why I say that uh, mastery and even genius possibly, but at least good the game of good is in the presentation of nuance or the existence and composition of nuances. Um, so it would tell me that the having the mindset of a skilled laborer, um, taking the time to build every piece to its um, greatest degree an nth degree of sophistication probably would be where one should rest their attention and their focus rather than uh, 
natural endowments and um, just to say that uh, nuances they matter so that's my video and thank you for watching